Hello, thank you all for sticking around. Uh, I'm going to ask a few questions that I'm sure are on all of our minds. And we ought to have a little time to have some Q&A uh, at the end. So maybe we'll see how it goes. I'll just ask you to either come down or shout it out and I'll repeat the question. Uh, I'm William Berger and I'm here to speak to our director, Susan Fromke, and co-director and editor, did I get that right? Peter Livingston, first of all, wow, thank you. Thank you. And as I'm sure you can imagine, my first question, I'm curious to know, uh, not in horrifying historic detail, but how this came about. Like, did you set out to make a film about the Met or about this moment in 1966 or a company biography or what was the original plan, Susan? I actually think it actually started, um, I've been, um, I should say, I've been lucky in that over really the last 30 years I've had a chance to make a lot of films with Peter Gelb who is now the hmm. um, general manager of the Met. Right. And uh, we had been having dinner one night and he just said it's the, you know, it's the 50th anniversary of the Met being at Lincoln Center and we started just thinking, like, is there a story there? And then we realized that because at the time, 50 years ago, um, or even like er much earlier than that, the Met was such an important cultural institution that it actually became the raison d'etre for Lincoln Center. And we thought, well, wow, that's, that's a really interesting story. At the same time, we realized that we had this wonderful footage that was shot by Bob Drew, who is um, someone who I've admired for years as a filmmaker. He, um, it was this footage that was shot six weeks prior to the opening of the New Met in 1966. And it was called Countdown to Curtain. You see a lot of the last third of the film is um, that footage. This, and it's, it's, it's real documentary footage, some of the earliest kind of handheld sync sound camera footage. And we had that footage that really tells the story of what it was like to bring, to get to opening night. So we thought, in a way, we had an ending. We didn't know what else we had, but we had footage for an ending. And, you know, with all these films, it starts with the, like a little kernel of an idea, and then it just, um, you know, as you start to research and as you start to talk to people, a lot of different storylines develop. But I think one of the last people that we interviewed, oddly enough, was Leotine Price. And when we did that interview, at that point we really realized we had a film because she brought so much together and she brought just this enormous humor and wit to the film as well. Um, and her own personal story is, is, is so f wonderful, really, as, as were some of the other personal stories we started to uncover as well. So that's how we started. And I mean, you had archival footage, but this didn't feel to me, it felt like an ongoing story, like a story of people now and their lives and the past all together. Not like, say, a, a documentary about a war or something that went on. I mean, was that a product of people talking to people and their memories, or just did you have a different approach? It wasn't a talking, it didn't have the feel of a talking heads thing to me. Well, uh, that's to, really I'll nice. I'll get to you, Peter. That's really to nice to right. hear. Um, first of all, I come from the documentary uh, cinema verite um, genre. That's, that's every film up to this film, is the, that's the type of film I've made, right. which does not include any archival generally. Right. And it usually doesn't include any experts, you know. It's, it's like you, you're filming a story as it unfolds before the camera. And I think that our approach here, once we started hearing um, some of the stories, like one of the earliest stories we heard was Richard Holmes' story. He is the character who was in the children's chorus, and he's such a great storyteller. And the stories, you know, he, he takes us into the old med, he tells us the problems with the old med, he takes us into the closing night of the med, and then he can actually tell us about Zeffirelli. So, I mean, we realized that these personal stories could really help us tell the story, and they all had their own little story arc. And I think, um, you know, when we started editing, we started editing scenes more than kind of working from a script, which is what a lot of traditional archival films are like. Right. Now, Peter, Peter might have a few. Had a script. We, actually, I, we never I, did I, have a script. I remember seeing you kind of late hours at the Met 
coming out from your loft My space. Lair. Yes, lair. your lair, Phantom of the Opera, like with these bug eyes. Just now, I assume you were looking at hundreds of hours, or I don't know how many hours, but lots and lots and lots of archival footage. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, we've Susan and I would always kind of marvel at how many photos and the resources that the Metropolitan Opera Archive mm -hmm. granted us, um, the amazing um, resources that we had as a result of our archive producer, Prudence Arndt, who supplied us with the wonderful stuff. But the fact of the matter is that we had wonderful photos, thousands of photos, lots of footage of certain things and not of others at all. Right. So you can see there's, what's, what's wonderful about the very end of the film and seeing Countdown and seeing them getting ready for that first night, that opening night, is that you actually finally get to see people behind the scenes in footage and on stage in footage. And there's actually precious little of that, um, even though there are literally more than 4,000 photos I had in my bins. Uh, to choose from, uh, just glorious photos, um, you know, hundreds of which appear, of course, in the film. But there was actually very little footage that wasn't kind of hokey footage. You know, there's, there was old, right. old newsreel footage from behind the scenes, but it was all kind of, okay, action, you know, and people putting on makeup and stuff. But, um, and so it, that, that was challenging, but in a, in a wonderful way, you know. But how does that work? Do you go looking for something through all that, or do you look at stuff, at footage and and stills and see what the story you, you is that's emerging. You go both ways, both right. ways. I think, you know, you, you use these, these wonderful interviews, certainly Leontine, Richard, um, Al Hubei at the beginning and at the, toward the end, and those lead you. Mm -hmm. But you also have to keep yourself open to, if, you're, if you truly are a documentary filmmaker, you have to keep yourself open to what the material tells you and the stories right. that the material tells and there's plenty of that here. I mean, I'm not going to go into details, but there are plenty of instances where the footage and the photos took us in a different direction than we were expecting to go. Like one of the, an example of that would be that we, um, we really felt like we needed to find somebody who had worked with Wallace Harrison, the architect. Mm -hmm. we, we were, and we realized, and we really did a big search for that, and we couldn't find anyone who was still alive. And it was through that search that we met his daughters, three of them. We, only one is in the film. And, and, and then that led us to this amazing story about how the chandeliers kind of were designed starting from an accident. And so, yeah, I heard you know, an aha a, in the audience at that moment. That was, that was and exciting. That was like totally unexpected, totally unknown. I mean, we really had to convince the Met that that was a true story. You know, I mean, right. we had to be very carefully vetted because everybody up to that time was saying that these chandeliers were designed, as they were certainly manufactured in Austria, at the Lobmeyer, you know, um, factory, which is a phenomenal place. But, um, you know, these daughters really wanted to give their father the credit they felt he deserved, you know. So that was just serendipity, which I tell you, as a filmmaker, I believe in that. I believe yeah, in luck. Absolutely. Like what they were talking yeah, about. Right. I was just going to jump on that just for one second to say that, you know, when I came on, because I came on as the editor, so I came on after a bunch of stuff had been shot, and certainly the interviews um, with uh, the Leskies had, were, were just shot just as right. we were starting, but that we exactly. knew about that story. And that scene that you see there of the, the splat, what we call it, the splat scene of the accident, and also realizing that this design, so to speak, this, this Sputnik satellite splat had to be turned into something three-dimensional, you mm -hmm. know, to have it become an architectonic reality. Um, that was one of the first scenes that we that was cut. And um, as the editor, for me, that was I knew we were onto something magical, you know. And um, that was kind of all I needed when I was getting started. We, we've talked about this: how you 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 kind of grab onto magical things and you let them take you where they're going to take you. And that was the first scene as, as the editor of the film that, that did that for me. There are plenty of them I could talk about, but I won't. But also, that was another thing, too, that um, Peter found this amazing piece of music from Lohengrin. Mm -hmm. And he cut yes, to I that. Yes, I cut Wagner. The music. He yes. cut Wagner. Actually, and he actually, yeah, we were hearing up at the Met Opera from a lot of the people, you actually cut Wagner, you mean edited some of Wagner's <laughs> Peter did, but, but it was the thing that gave, I think, us the confidence that the whole soundtrack to the film could be opera, 
could yeah. be opera. And so that, that was Very dramatic. And, and Alberic as Robert Moses and things. <laughs> it was beautiful. Um, I want to ask more about that. But first, when you, when you got this story together, you had you must have realized that you had then additional stories because first of all, with the, the cast of Leontine and Justino and Rosalind Elias and Thomas Shippers, the conductor, the idea that this was actually an American national story. It was a bigger story and that came through. Was there a certain point at which you realized, wait a second, this is about the Met and the world or this is a bigger story than we thought or something like that? Did it evolve that way? I guess what I would say to that is um, it makes me think about calibrating narrative components in a film when you're making mm. a film like this. Yes, to some degree, we knew that the the opera was built or conceptualized, thought, you know, imagined in a larger social and socio-political context, right. which is referred to in the film. But we also had to be careful that we not go too deeply into that. Right. Right, because we wanted to have, not that we wanted to ignore the world around it, but we definitely didn't want to, to commit too far, too much, too deeply into that larger s sphere because it would, could take us down some pretty yeah. interesting, but also make the film that's already kind of long, lo much longer. Um, and we would have, that would have, we, we, we wouldn't have allowed, allowed that to happen, so we would have had to get rid of other things as well. Does that make sense? Yes, perfect, but you didn't, you didn't shy away. There, it's not no. all warm and fuzzy. I mean, there are civil rights and Cold War and urban renewal, That's the all whole that drama. That's thing I was talking about. We, right. we had to make sure that there were the, all those things which are part of the truth of how the opera came to be right. were dealt with, you know, and shown respect, but without going crazy, you know, because the opera and the singers and these characters really were our most important but things we, to concern ourselves with. We actually, when we first began, one of the earliest ideas we we thought the film would be actually was the whole story of what Lincoln Square community, the community that was demolished, yeah. and what happened to them. And we had heard rumors. I mean, we had heard all sorts of rumors because when they first started to demolish Lincoln Square, that's where West Side Story was shot. I mean, the opening shots of West Side Story right. are actually where the fountain is, kind of. It's the earliest of, of the, um, what they were calling, what Robert Moses was calling slums. All the residents of that area was n <laughs> thought it was their neighborhood. It was not a slum Home. in their mind. Yeah. But we thought. But what was very, we had heard that uh, many of the people in that community had been moved to Co-op City, and that's what became Co-op City. And we thought there was there may be a, a big storyline there. In fact, it didn't pan out at all because we it was very very hard to find anybody who was still around that we could actually find to film who had actually lived at Lincoln Square, and we were very yeah. lucky to find. Mickey, Mian, and Joe Sanchez. Who How did you find them? Is that a secret? Well, you're not going to no, reveal it's, your it's secrets? No, it's like, I mean, it's research. It's just yeah. research. But there's, Muffy there's Muffy. yeah, Muffy Meyer, who wow. um, w was one of our producers, she, <laughs> she just went online. She went to some chat room. I don't even know what that means, to tell you the truth. But she went <laughs> onto a chat room, and she started chatting with Mickey. Wow. And then, and it was through that, uh, through a friend of Mickey's that she found Joe. Joe actually lives in Delray Beach, Florida, but we flew him up and, wow. you know, and he just saw it the other day on the HD broadcast down in South Florida. So that's how we found them. But, and we were so lucky to have them. But then yeah. that story, you know, it's, it always is, you know, um, Peter says, you know, that story kind of took a back. I mean, it's a very important story, but it didn't become the story of the film. But, but a part of it, right, yeah. yeah. An important part of it. And last... I, I don't think we, there's no way we would have ever told the story without them. Right. For sure. Yeah. Right. So it's all... Someone else might have, though, which is interesting to me. So, um, uh, and last question from me on, is about the music. Okay, did you fight over this? Who made those choices? How did you do that? Because to me, it seemed like somebody wrote the soundtrack and yet they, they were all familiar pieces. It was so marvelous. Well, the way I th think of it is Peter had, had put this wonderful music under the chandelier, and then I was saying like, oh, I know a few pieces, but you know, I don't know that. You know, we're, we make a lot of other kind of documentaries, not just classical music, and so I knew the opening of Butterfly, I knew the opening of Valkyrie, I knew the opening of La Traviata, like almost everybody knows. Right. But Peter, I have to say, Peter and Grace Rowe and a few people at the Met 
he did the deep, deep dig and spent, I think, many, many nights, late at night, all night long, listening to opera. So I'll let you take it from there. I don't know about all night long, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, 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 the music was just such a, such a kind of, it's a, a bonanza, you know, there's, it's not like you're, oh my God, where am I going to get music from? Right, well, you know, that's true. <laughs> that's you know, true. Like, I'm really having a hard time yeah. finding a sad piece here. Or, you know, <laughs> The, the, Bad guy music, yeah, plenty of it, uh, yeah. But, but no, but, but that does, I have been thinking about this because I figured you might ask me a question about music or ask a, a question about music. And one of the, you know, the, the challenge at first was, and I, we can tell the story about Gouda Demerong and, and uh, Rudolf Bing. Um, now, Susan knows a lot more about opera than I do. I was lucky enough when I was younger to, to have gone to a, a handful or a couple of handful of operas, but that was a long time ago. I won't tell you how long ago, but it was a long time ago. And... Um, that's not, not in any way to mean in offense to opera. I just haven't gotten around to getting back to it. But, um, but taking this job on, when you do deal with music and you incorporate music into a cut, especially something like this where the music carries its context mm. so close mm. and everyone who knows opera knows those pieces and they know the context in which that music is used, it's a little intimidating. Because you're thinking, you like, you know, you know exactly where every one of those pieces of music appears and how it appears and why it appears and what's happening. Someone's dying or being born or being married. Or, and at first, it was like, well, maybe we can use those, that context for each of the, to, you know, to inform our film, or or the film will inform the choices that we make. That lasted about two days, because it's just impossible. Yeah. You know, you you. you because then actually you do end up limiting yourself. And so what we chose to do was just use whatever works. And in the case of, if that makes, you know, works, you know, capital W. And when, when I first used Go to Demerong in the Bing scene, no, was it, no, it's Valkyrie. Valkyrie. Is it Valkyrie? Valkyrie? Sorry, it's Wagner. But, um, the ring. So he shows, oh, well, I know it. Um, but you, you, you kind of like, you can't use that I know. there. It was under the Bing scene. It's, I, I, to me, the end of Valkyrie is some of the most beautiful music in the right. world. And it's, the um, farewell. it's uh, where um, Voltan is taking Brunhilde up to the Ring of Fire, you know, because right. she's betrayed him. And there it is under this picture of being with his dachshunds. And I'm going like, oh, that's never going to work. But now I wouldn't change. I, I, I was Perfect. hoping you wouldn't say it because I feel so foolish now even no, thinking that because it's such a beautiful, beautiful. No, no. It works so beautifully in the film now. It's, yeah. Did, well, you, when you heard that, did you have that association? No, it was, uh, for me, I was just thinking, okay, well, that's the first moment where Votan shows emotion. Mm -hmm. And it's oh. the only time when Bing shows emotion, there's a I little dachshund. That was a puddle. And then Hansel and Gretel, um, when, I mean, it's not about gingerbread, but it's music that brings tears to my eyes. It was the end of the old Met, and I was a puddle. It was just completely a mess. And I thought, how great that it, maybe he hadn't thought or even known right. what's happening with Hansel and Gretel in that moment, because it, it's well, subliminal. And that's the thing, you know, uh, we chose to um, let go of that, carrying context idea that I was talking about and just let the music work in a new way mm. and um, work in our film and, and, and I didn't mean to, to bring that up to, to embarrass you because it was, you know, to your credit, I mean, it, that lasted about a half a day and, right. and we realized it was working. Let's just see how, let's see how it comes to rest in our film and, and works. But with regard to Hansel and, Hansel and Gretel, that was interesting because I love that piece of music. I'm just completely crazy about it. But it also works because I found the um, um, Old Lang Syne, it works perfectly. It's in key. So it's like, it's just a crazy, talk about serendipity. Yeah, Spotify list of sad, heartbreaking music <laughs> yeah. for no reason. Yeah, so it just worked. I found the film remarkable because it felt complete and comprehensive, but at the same time I know that it's a fraction of a humongous story. So my question is whether there were any threads that you had to sacrifice. Mm. To, at the final cut. Cold War, well, Civil I, no, Rights I would, Movement. I was going to say, I think, the, um, I think w one story that was very, very complex was the Wallace Harrison story. And, and what, you know, and how much of a defeat on some level the design was in the end for him. It was, and there was a lot of betrayal involved in that too that involved the Met Board. And, um, we really wanted to tell that story and we there was no censorship at all that we couldn't tell the story it's just that it became 
it just became kind of overwhelming at, the, at that point in the film to tell it. Um, I also think that um, it was, we've had many different, we had many different versions of the whole um, Robert Moses Title I, you know, the Housing Act of 1949. It became kind of like a more traditional, you know, documentary, archival film documentary, and so we, we really um, tried to streamline that as much as possible. Um, and we, you know, the whole story of the acoustics, you know, which is really fascinating and how, you know, the um, Met Opera's acoustics are so wonderful, whereas right next door at the Philharmonic, they've always been problematic. But these were stories that we really, in the end, just didn't have enough time to tell. Yeah, I, I think um, um, there there was a, a great deal of time and money and energy and focus paid to that, and um, there was an acoustician who was acousticians plural who were brought on board, who uh, made a mess of things, correct? Mm -hmm. And then they brought on. Um, they were the, the same ones who did, did um, Philharmonic Hall, and then Bing uh, got rid of them. And then um, Cyril. Harris was board, brought on as the, as, the, as the acoustician for the final design, and he worked very closely with uh, Wallace Harrison and his designers, including Tad Lesky. And um, I think it's safe to say that the psychoacoustic effects of the interior, including the way that the seats are installed in the interior, is pretty fascinating. You should look it up. And it's it, every single seat, and I'm not exaggerating when I say every single seat in the opera house is placed uniquely on its own, not attached in any way to any other seat on either side of it or behind or in front of it for the best possible sight lines. Because as Herman Krawitz said in a scene that we did have to drop, when you see well, you hear well. I had heard something about African mahogany. Yes. Okay, I, I just sounds African terribly mahogany, exotic. Uh, the velvet of the seats and right. the floor, there's, there's a lot that goes, that went into it. In the end, what did most of the engineers say? It's luck. Yeah. You know? Allow me to repeat this. Uh, for the people in the back, uh, she, uh, the lady asked, as a younger person, she was interested in following through the subsequent decades of what's been going on at the house or what the rest of the story is, and was there any intention to do that? Did I get that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I got that right. Um, uh, thank you for the question. And not, and not to be flipped, but I think we had to focus, it's part of you know, the calibration of the storytelling, and we had to focus, we felt, on a story that ended with the opening of the Opera House, because the Opera House does it such an amazing, the Met, you know, on PBS and elsewhere, does such an amazing job of telling the story, and has told the story on multiple occasions in different ways, about the story of the new Met and performances throughout history. I hear what you're saying. Um, we did consider it for a very short period of time. Well, yeah, um, I mean, we just it, felt we couldn't get yeah, to it. Right. I mean, we felt like really this this story has so many personal stories, and we wanted to um, end with kind of um, you know f kind of rounding out the stories that all of our main storytellers um, their last thoughts, and we wanted it to be kind of more of a poetic ending. I think an emotional ending. Um, we had tried, we had looked at, I mean, as Peter said, they're wonderful, um, you know, there's wonderful footage of some of the great performances of the Met and the great arias by the great singers from the last 50 years. I'm sure Will could rattle them off, you know? Lots of them. And we, but, but you know, these arias are three, four minutes long, and so there was just really, we tried, to edit them, and it just did, but these were people, these were singers that we had no connection with. Yeah, there was no characterological it's, connection to the, to, it would have, so, it was, it, we tried a, a, a montage of, you know, selects of Pavarotti and Domingo and, you know, uh, but the fact of the matter is that Leontine's career ended not too long after that, I guess in the mid-80s. 85, right? 85, yeah. Um, not too long. So, okay. You had it there. That was years. in your film. Yeah. Yes, yes, it is. We had her final it is. Right. It is. That's where I got that. So, that's. Yeah. Well, there's possibility of a sequel. Okay, one it. more. Thank you for this wonderful documentary. I enjoyed your last one, too, about the Lepage Ring. Oh, just great. wonderful. Um, uh, your point is very good about how every seat is unique 
and you have these wonderful sight lines and sound. But the opposite is true too. From the stage, it, it, this is such a huge house, 3,800 seats, but from the stage, it appears small. And, and it's like a, you could see everybody in the audience from the stage. There are no hidden places. It's like one intimate living room. So it's really an incredible building. I got that from Leontine when she just, I don't know what's going on. I'm just listening to my great voice right now. <laughs> Wasn't that wonderful? I felt like I was singing to Staten Island. Staten Island. Yeah, yeah. Right, 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 right. It is true. And um, I think we need to cut this off now so we can move, but you can come back tomorrow uh, where we'll be here again. We'll be back. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Susan Frumke and Peter Livingston. <laughs>